So I want to welcome everybody to our training today. We're going to do a primer for landlord-tenant actions. Um, here at uh, our center, we're seeing a lot of uh, tenants come in with issues um, regarding landlords, the state of the property, evictions, and today my goal is to kind of go over some of the law with you, state law, um, City of Evanston law, and City of Chicago, because a lot of the City of Evanston ordinances were taken from the City of Chicago landlord-tenant ordinance. They have some little deviations, but there's other things that they've taken word for word. So today I just want to go over some tips for you if you're ever handling a file, things to look for, things to ask for. We'll kind of go over the process from beginning to end, and we'll talk about things that you do along the way as you prepare for trial. I will have you guys note that a lot of times these matters don't actually go to trial. Usually there is a chance for the landlord and the tenant to talk and try to come up with a resolution that they can both live with. Generally, it's the landlord will drop the money count if the tenant moves out by a certain time. And for the tenant, they may want to leave, they just want to have sufficient time to find another place. So I'll let you know that while typically you may ask and file a jury demand, and either side can do that, typically you try to come up with some sort of resolution. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes it's a matter of getting everybody to talk outside the courtroom and coming up with an agreed order. Well, let's talk about the Illinois Forcible Entry and Detainer Act. And I have it listed here for your reference. And the way that the process has to start is the tenant is required to get notice. That notice could be <coughs> you haven't paid your rent, so I have them demanding that you pay by a certain time. It could be you're in violation of your lease, and so therefore, based on that violation, you have a certain amount of time to fix that violation or to vacate. Or it could be a 30-day notice, basically we're not renewing the lease, or if it's a month-to-month -month tenant, you're giving them notice that they have to vacate the property by a certain time. But per statute, tenant is entitled to notice. And the notice has to be delivered specific ways. It either has to be delivered to the tenant in person or to someone over the age of 13 who resides there. It cannot be a guest. It can't be someone who's just there for the day or a relative who happened to stop by. It has to be someone over the age of 13 who actually lives at the premises. You can also send it by certified and regular mail. The last way, posting, you only can do, if it looks like the tenant has already vacated the premises and you just have to formally do this in order to start the process to get the property back. There have been times when landlords have taped the notices to the door and the tenant is still living there. And what has to happen when you have a tenant who's living there, you can't just post it. That's not appropriate. So one of the things that you're going to do down the line when you get a client is ask them, did they get notice and how were they notified that there was a default? So just keep in mind they're, they're required to get notice and notice is delivered couple of different ways, either to the tenant in person, to someone over the age of 13 who resides there, by regular and certified mail, or posting if it looks like there's no one actually in possession of the premises. And that's, we're talking Illinois, right? Yeah. Okay. The question State. was, we're talking Illinois. Yeah. Yes, we are, and that's also going to be time at the end for all questions. Okay. Now, when the tenant is given notice, after the notice period has expired, for a five-day notice, they are presented with that demand for payment, and they have to pay within the five days. If they do not pay, then the landlord can start the forcible entry and detainer action. They can file the complaint, the summons and the complaint. If it's a 10-day notice and the violations are not corrected, after the 10 days have expired, the landlord can file the summons and the complaint. Keep in mind that weekends and holidays are not factored in. So if the 10 days are up on a holiday, you have to go to the next day. And if for any reason someone were to file the action too soon, it could be dismissed and the landlord would have to start over again. 
I was actually just in court on Friday, and the landlord did the service, the five-day non-payment himself, and the same day that he gave them the five-day notice, he went to the courthouse to file his summons and complaint. And the judge was like, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I have to dismiss this action because you did not wait the five days. So it's always important to pay attention to the dates on when things were given. There's an affidavit that is filled out when the tenant is notified, if it's personal service on the tenant or someone over the age of 13. The person doing that service fills out an affidavit. It's a sworn statement saying, I did serve this person. The reason why you want to do the certified mail is you have proof of when it went out. <coughs> Doesn't mean that they have to go sign for it and pick it up, because I've had people think that if they just ignored the green slip, they weren't served. But you cannot ignore your mail. That's not a defense. When the tenant is served with the summons and the complaint, sometimes there is a question of do they have to file an answer? Is an answer required? They don't have to file an answer and admit or deny any of the allegations. It's presumed there's a general denial. That's why, and the nature of landlord tenant is it's a fast pace. Generally, the return dates, when a, when a landlord files a summons and a complaint, the return date will usually be seven or 14 days later. And the purpose of that is if someone is rightfully displaced from their property, if a landlord is entitled to rent and isn't getting it, or entitled to possession, they want to make sure the process goes fast because you don't want someone to go for months and months and months without rent because generally most people use the rent money to pay the mortgage. So it's a speedy process. A lot of times when people are in court pro se, they think that they can ask for months and months and months of continuances. Generally, when you go in, the first time a person goes in, they can ask for time to get an attorney, and they'll get like a one week continuance. But the judge wants to make sure everything stays on track so that it can be a speedy process. Also, if you're gonna end up in it with a trial, a, in a jury demand, that also takes more time. So that's why a lot of times things can be worked out without going to trial because neither party wants to drag it out. Or sometimes the tenant may want to, but the attorney will have to make a judgment call on the merits of the case in order to do all of this, of course. But in general, there's a general denial of the allegations. We'll talk somewhere down the line about if there's counterclaims and that sort of thing because that could change how you approach the case, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Either party can ask for a jury trial. It could be the landlord or the tenant, the plaintiff or the, <coughs> plaintiff or the defendant. If there is a lease that says the tenant waives their right to a jury trial, it's not enforceable. There are some terms that landlords may put into a lease that will be deemed unenforceable by the court, whether the tenant signed it or not. And that is just to level the playing field and, and to give everybody a chance to be heard. In general, a landlord wants a bench trial. That means they want the judge to hear the case and give them a decision. Tenants, you generally are gonna file a jury demand because you may want a jury of their peers to hear the situation and assess the situation, especially if there's counterclaims and other things involved where there may be a situation where the landlord now owes a tenant money based on penalties. So just keep in mind that landlords tend to want bench trials and tenants tend to want jury trials. The standard of proof in a forcible case is a preponderance of the evidence. So that is the standard when you are making claims, for example, if someone says there's a breach of the warranty of habitability, meaning there's something wrong with the unit, there's going to have to be some proof presented. It can't just be, I don't like the color of the paint on the wall. It has to be something like, I have a leak and it is now gone into mold and it's causing respiratory issues and there's reports and that sort of proof that you can offer to substantiate the claim but the standard of proof is a preponderance of the evidence. That is the standard the judge or the jury is going to examine when hearing the case. <coughs> when a, someone comes in, if you're doing an intake or someone says, I need to come in and talk to you about this case, it's a landlord-tenant case, 
I tend to ask them if they have these things to bring them in with them. It makes the process a little bit easier for the intake and for strategy on what can and cannot be done with the case. If they have a copy of their lease, ask them to bring in a copy of their lease and any addendums. And you'd be surprised, there are people who may have lived in the same building for 10 or 20 years and there was never a renewed lease. It was just the original lease and now technically they're month to month tenants because every year the landlord didn't have them sign a new lease. Their rent never went up. There are all sorts of things that could come into play if there's not a new lease. Um, ask them to bring in a copy of that lease, any addendums to the lease. And it should be the signed copy because what should happen is a tenant should be asked to sign two copies of the lease. One the landlord will keep for his records and one he'll give to the tenant after he's countersigned it. So you're going to want to get a copy of the lease. If they have receipts or canceled checks to prove they paid rent, copies of money orders, however they pay, some people are now paying online. If they can have their bank statements that shows that the rent came out, you're going to want copies of that. If they've given a security deposit and they have a copy of the payment proof of that, you want that as well. If there's any written communication between the parties, and back when times were simpler, people used to, you know, contact the landlord. You would write and say, I need these repairs done. With technology, now you'll see a lot of people communicate by text. So there'll be text messages between the landlord and the tenant. If they're able to produce those for you, generally they can email those to you. Text messages can be sent as emails so you can see what the conversation was between the parties. I always try to encourage people if they're coming in to me at that point saying in the future if there's any issues and this goes for a landlord or a tenant try to put everything in writing because then you have a clearer paper trail sometimes it's just harder when people didn't keep text messages or things don't totally seem as clear as what they're telling you in the text like they'll say we said this but the text doesn't really allude to that but if they have text messages even phone records, because sometimes they'll say, no, I called the landlord 10 times, and here is my printout from my cell phone of all the calls that I placed. So any sort of things that they may have to show that there's been some communication or whatever that communication may be, any notices that they've gotten, either from the landlord or if there was some violation that was posted and they have proof of that, ask them to bring in anything that's been received regarding their tenancy at, at that place. Photos, if they have pictures of certain conditions, if they have videotapes, ask them to bring in whatever they have and also to think about who else has knowledge of the situation because if it ends up going to trial, you're going to have to possibly call witnesses. So it seems like it's a lot, but it's kind of a methodical way to build your case and the more that they can bring in in the beginning, the better you can draw a conclusion of what their you know possibilities are they could have counterclaims because maybe they told the landlord there's a leak maybe they told the landlord there's mold maybe they had someone come out and do a mold report which they shared with the landlord but it was ignored i once had somebody who had a stove that wasn't functioning but the appliances were the landlord's responsibility and i mean for months they had no stove and so they ended up buying a stove and deducting that from the rent and the landlord was trying to evict them. But they gave him sufficient notice that you need to fix it or replace it or we're gonna have to do it ourselves and that's what ended up happening. And so when he tried to evict, he had no merit to his case. But not having the paperwork could have you know, presented a bigger problem. So if they're coming in to meet with you, whatever they have, ask them to bring it in. If they don't have much, you can always send them home with their homework list or a laundry list of things and items that you'd like to have from them that could help with their case. So this is just kind of a guideline of things to start asking for and having them to think about if you end up not being able to resolve the issue with the other party. The notice. You're going to want to review whatever notice they received. You're going to want to make sure that the time is accurate. When was it given to them? How soon did the landlord file? Is the amount correct? Because sometimes landlords will build in these other costs that they're not allowed to ask for in that notice. Late payments, those sort of things cannot be factored in. It is strictly the rent that they are to ask for. 
So you have to verify that the notice was correct, that the summons and complaint were filed timely, and that everything in there is correct. I want to kind of differentiate for everybody a difference between Evanston and the city of Chicago. For non-payment of rent in the city of Chicago, tenants are served with a five-day notice. For Evanston, it is 10 days. So sometimes you'll have to check what city or village you're in. They may have their own little twists on the requirements. So for Evanston, which we're in, it's, it's 10 day for non-payment. And that can be confusing because for the city of Chicago, a 10 day notice is for a violation of the lease. So just make sure it's the right notice, it's the right type of notice, it was served properly, the time period for them to correct or pay has expired before filing. You want to review the summons and the complaint to make sure that it's accurate. You also want to talk about service of the summons and complaint because typically the sheriff will do the service. And so they, the landlord pays a fee for the sheriff to go out and they'll do service and there'll be an affidavit of service in the file. If the sheriff is not able to do service, then typically you have to ask to have a special process server appointed. And generally they ask you if the person is like a licensed private investigator, or someone who has accountability because this person is gonna have to swear under oath that they did service. So you want to double check on how they were served the summons and complaint. You'd be amazed at how many people have said, oh, well the landlord handed me my summons and complaint. Well, the person who's party to the action can't serve. There was also, I was in court and there was a strange case, it wasn't mine, but I was listening because the landlord asked another tenant to serve a fellow tenant. But didn't explain to them what they were serving, just kind of said, hey, can you give this to blah, blah, blah. And it turned out that the person didn't even know they were doing service. So strange things happen, so you always want to know how people were served. And the great thing with things being online is if they have the summons and the complaint number and they have the, the uh, court case number, you can go online and see if service has happened and see how, when they're saying it happened, how they're saying it happened. I had someone, we had an eviction case, and they were saying she was personally served. That was odd because she was at work at the time that they were saying that they served her. So she was never personally served. The maintenance person filed an affidavit that was not correct. So we had to address that because I was like, oh, well, when was she served? How was she served? Oh, personal service. I looked at it and I was like, were you served? Were you at home? She's like, I was at work and my boss would say that I was at work. It's, I was never served. So you want to know how they were served with the summons and complaint as well. Then you want to talk about any defenses they may have. Maybe the apartment is in such a bad condition that there's a warranty, a violation of the warranty of habitability, which everyone is entitled to a decent place to live. There's a warranty of habitability that comes with any lease, which means things like electrical, plumbing, these things that are provided have to be per code, they have to be adequate. I've had people where there was no gas, there was no electricity, there were leaks, uh, bed bugs are a major issue these days, mold, all of these things could be an affirmative defense. And that's why it's also important to ask them, have you notified the landlord about these conditions? Because if they've been notified and they didn't do anything, that's another problem. So you want to talk about any defenses they may have. I've had people who they sent in the payments and the landlord has them mail everything to a P.O. box. And for whatever mm -hmm. reason, they weren't going to pick up the rent checks on time, so they were saying the person didn't pay when there were checks just sitting there. So if they have proof of payment, that's another defense. So you want to kind of look at the situation and think, well, are there any defenses they may have for this action? It could be that they pay. It could be that there is an issue with the apartment and they notified the landlord and the landlord didn't do anything about it. And maybe they cure it on their own. I had someone who brought in the exterminator on their own 
and so therefore they were entitled to a discount on the rent for the amount that they spent, and the landlord didn't see it that way. Finally he did, but those are the things that could come up where you see a defense for the tenant, and that's something you can use for the negotiation. You also want to ask the client, what's their end goal? What's important to them? Sometimes people don't want to stay where they are. They're having issues with the landlord, the apartment, whatever it may be, they don't want to stay. So it's about, okay, do you just want more time till you can find somewhere else? Other times, people are like, I just signed this lease, and I don't really want to go. I want to try to work this out. You know, my kids are in school, and we're all settled. I don't want to move again. So it's important to kind of ask the, the client, potential client, what's your goal? What would be your ideal workout to this situation? Because then you also may have to give them a reality check on what the possibilities are. Because sometimes they'll say, oh, well, I just want to leave, but I need like six to eight months. And that's not always feasible. Generally, it's not. You know, if it's a big problem, the landlord wants the tenant out, the tenant wants to go, six to eight months isn't a reasonable amount of time. But maybe 30 days is, maybe 60 days. Anytime it's beyond that, you know, you have to kind of get creative and say they'll pay you a certain amount of money until they move out so that at least the landlord has some money in the meantime. Those are some of the negotiation tools that you can use because they may need more time. You know, if this is a public record and it's hit their credit or it's hit, you know, their background check, they may have to find an apartment and it may take a little bit longer. So those are things to keep in mind. But ask them, what's your end goal? What is it that you want to see happen here? There may be some statutory damages that they're entitled to. There are certain rules that if you violate them, certain laws that if you violate them, the tenant is entitled to payment and they get their attorney's fees paid. For example, if the landlord doesn't pay interest every year, every year interest on a security deposit is to be paid to the tenant. If someone has lived in a place for 10 or 15 years, sometimes landlords just don't do it. They're like, oh, it's like 60 cents, it's a dollar. I don't want to write a check for a dollar. There are statutory penalties for that. So you also have to look at whether or not they're entitled to some damages just because the landlord violated these rules, these laws, and usually along with that, those damages comes the award of attorney fees. And then you need to discuss the next steps with the client. Is there a court date coming up? Have they already been to court? When do they go back to court? Have they had any conversation with the landlord or the landlord's represent representatives? So you have to figure out what's going on. Because it's a fast pace, they may have gone to court yesterday, they come in to see you, but they've got court next week. And normally it's set for trial. So you want to ask them what the developments are, when is the next court date, anything coming up. 10-day notices, and this is for Evanston, should include the past due rent. Late fees, damages, attorney's fees, all inappropriate. And I have, have some case law here for you to reference, just so you can get a better understanding, but it's just not, it's not appropriate to ask for anything except the past due rent. And if the tenant tries to tender the rent, the landlord can't refuse it. And there have been landlords who the person has come up with, like maybe they're a month behind, they have the money, and the landlord's refusing to accept it. Not appropriate. Now, if the landlord doesn't care about money, and they just want the property back, they want possession back, they can file for possession only. A joint action is when they file for the past due rent that they're owed and possession. So it's up to the landlord when he files if he just wants possession or if he wants a joint action for money and possession. If he's going to ask for money, he has to get service. He can't do a posting. If they can't seem to serve the tenant or anyone who lives there and they just post it, all they're going to be awarded is possession by the judge. Cannot get a money count. And those are times when a landlord has to make a decision. Maybe they've had a hard time serving this tenant, 
I mean, a tenant sees the sheriff pull up in a squad car in uniform, they may not open the door and just say, yes, I'll take that. Sometimes they just stand there and they don't. So, and if a private investigator can't get them, and it's been a couple of weeks, and a couple of weeks go into a couple of months, the judge may ask the landlord or the landlord's representative, do you just want possession? I'll give you an order for possession right now, but you can't be awarded money. So it'll come down to what's more important to the landlord, the money count and possession or just possession. But anytime they're asking for the money, they have to have service. Now, I've already gone over this, I'm just talking again because this is really important and this is where a lot of times the case may derail right off, you know, right from the very beginning because the demand for rent or the demand for possession based on a lease violation or the 30 day notice was not delivered correctly. So it has to either be personal service on the tenant or someone over the age of 13 who resides at the property they can do um, certified and regular mail. Posting is only to be done if the tenant has moved out, but you want to formally get possession from the court because sometimes landlords don't want to, I haven't seen anybody for a few weeks, maybe they've moved out, I'm gonna go in, they left some things behind, I'm gonna remove everything, and then here the tenant comes back saying, you've unlawfully gone into my place, where are my items? So if they do a posting knowing that the person has already left, They'll get an order for possession, they can move the items, and they can take the property back and formally rent it again. So posting would be important to get that final step so that you can file for possession. Going over this. Now, once you've decided you're going to take the case, you're going to represent, this is for the tenants, you have to file your appearance. And at that time, if you're going to do a jury demand, you file the appearance in the jury demand. You will also, if there is um, the desire, you're going to ask for leave to file an answer because you may have affirmative defenses or counterclaims that you want to bring to the judge's attention. There's also a request for discovery, request to admit, request to produce, interrogatories. Although a lot of times the judge will just set it for trial and ask the parties if they can try to go out and work out something. If not, then come back in a week with everything because they're going to be able to see all of the evidence. So sometimes they'll set a discovery schedule, other times it's a faster pace and they'll set it for trial and tell everybody to bring all their evidence in with them, especially if it's going to be a bench trial. The judge will say just bring all of your evidence and be ready for trial. The settlement can occur at any time during the process. It could be the first time you go to court. Opposing counsel may say, let's talk, let's see what we can work out. Or they may not want to settle on the first court date, but after you talk and you say, well, you know, we have these counterclaims, we have these affirmative defenses, these are some issues, then you may get a phone call or a request for settlement after that first court date. I've had times where we've been set for trial and we go for a trial call and we settle it right before the trial is to happen. And a lot of times the parties just really want to work out something and both people want to walk away feeling like they won in some aspect, they want to win-win. Landlord wants his property back, tenant wants to move in a time frame that works for them. So a lot of times people may dig in their heels, clients may want to dig in their heels and then suddenly they're like, you know what, I don't want to go to trial, let's just work this out. It tends to go to trial when there's big issues and there are bigger counterclaims involved. It's been like the breach of warranty of habitability. And I had someone who ended up in the hospital from bug bites. Had a very, very bad reaction, incurred hospital bills, all their furniture, everything had to be thrown out because of the infestation and the landlord didn't do anything. So there was a counterclaim for all that she, the damages that she suffered. So that was a situation where nobody wanted to settle and we were prepared to go to trial. It settled in the end and the, the tenant did end up getting some money for that, but that's an extreme case, but it happens. And sometimes you don't want to settle because 
your client has such a good case, and if the landlord isn't being reasonable, landlord could have cut a check and been done with that well before we ended up going to trial, but just didn't want to, and didn't realize how serious it was. But bed bugs are a very big public health issue. And if they're in one apartment, they tend to be in other apartments. So another issue is a landlord who only treats the one unit versus the entire building. But settlement could and should happen at any point, but if not, then the parties will go to trial. So like I said, the first time you go in, you're gonna to wanna to just get leave to file your appearance and the jury demand. If this is at the Daily Center, the city of Chicago, you're gonna be transferred to a trial courtroom and a trial date is gonna be given, a next date. Those are the cases that will go like from the 14th floor to the 13th floor for the trial assignment. And those are the cases where they'll set a schedule for discovery. Second time up, they're gonna ask, you know, for leave to file the answer or the counterclaim. Generally, they give you 14 days. Everything it tends to be 14, seven or 14 days with landlord tenant. I don't know how they came up with that formula, but seven or 14 seems to be the big things that you get. Another thing that may come up if you've asked for a jury trial, and if you've asked for leave to file an answer and counterclaims, and there's gonna be discovery, is the landlord may file what's called a motion for use and occupancy. What that is is a request from the court saying, while this is going on, I'm entitled to receive some money, so give me an order stating that the tenant has to pay this amount while this is going on. You'll have a hearing on use and occupancy because they'll file their motion and it'll be set for a hearing date. Typically what you want to do if you're representing the tenant in a use and occupancy motion is they'll say an amount that they feel they're entitled to. You're going to want to refute that amount or come up with a, an amount that is actually justified based on the conditions of the property. You know, I had a case where they were charging $1,200 a month and they were asking for use and occupancy for $1,200. I looked at the rentals in that area and the rent was high compared to what was market rate. So I brought in proof of the market rate. But then I also talked about the defects within the apartment. She had an issue with roaches and mice. And I mean, she had video of mice scattering about and that sort of thing. So we had evidence that it's not, as he is advertising it, it's not a pristine, gorgeous apartment. It has its defects. So if you're going to judge, if you're going to award use and occupancy, and what you want to do is say, if you're going to award it, then that amount is incorrect. This is the correct amount, and here's why. So use and occupancy, if you're representing a tenant, is all about trying to, if the tenant is going to be forced to pay anything, come up with an amount that represents the current state of that unit, the current rental rates in that area, that sort of thing. So you'll come in, they may do the use and occupancy hearing, they'll want a status on the discovery. Where are we with the interrogatories? Where are we with the request to produce? Is there any movement towards settlement? And judges are always going to ask at these hearings any movement towards settlement because they want to see the parties resolve it. Use and occupancy, and this is something that a lot of people didn't realize. If you have a use and, use and occupancy hearing and the judge awards use and occupancy and the tenant doesn't pay it, the judge still can't give an order for possession. It's kind of like a moot thing that's still out there. And judges used to say, oh, I told you to pay use and occupancy, you didn't pay it, I'm entering the order for possession. That was something that went up on appeal, and it was a huge, huge, huge ding, because landlords used to count on use and occupancy if the case was going to drag out. It's one of those things that you can get an order for it, but at that level, the trial judge cannot order someone out of the apartment. There has to be a finding of fact. So sometimes people are still stuck on asking for use and occupancy, but what they don't realize is, even if there's an order to pay it, it's not an enforceable order, in that if the tenant doesn't pay, the judge cannot displace the tenant. And I have a case here for you guys to reference. And 
And as I said, and this gives you both sides of the coin, for a use and occupancy hearing, the plaintiff wants to say, no, this is how much my apartment should rent for. The defendant wants to present the evidence of why it should be reduced. So if you're ever representing a landlord, you want to talk about the market rate in the area, the great things about the unit. If you're the tenant, then you want to talk about the issues with the unit and why it's not worth the amount that the rent is. is. <clears throat> if you get to a fourth time up, there will be a uh, discovery status, settlement status. Generally, you don't get these many appearances in landlord tenants. It's a rare case where maybe there are huge, huge, huge problems with affirmative defenses, counterclaims, sometimes with commercial, but not for residential. Generally, by this time, the parties have worked out some sort of agreement. Typical settlements that you might negotiate. The typical thing could be the tenant says, you know what, I'll move out by this date. And if they agree to move out, the landlord will say, I'll dismiss the money count. That means I'm no longer going to ask for the back rent. But that also means that the parties waive defenses and counterclaims as well. So it's basically like we are resolving this right here, right now. My complaint against you will go away. <coughs> Your counterclaims against me will go away. You will vacate by a certain time, and I won't ask for money. There could also be a repayment plan that the parties enter into. Now, for a tenant who wants to stay, this is an ideal settlement. They may say, okay, I can pay the regular amount of rent and an additional 500 a month until I am caught up. And sometimes landlords are fine with that if it was a good tenant who maybe fell on hard times. So a repayment plan is also an option, and the order will specify the amount of the payments, when they are due, and what happens if there is if a payment is missed. So it may say, okay, well, we have this repayment plan. If the tenant fails to honor the repayment plan, I can get an instant order for possession. That's usually how that works out, is that you want to make sure your client can honor that repayment plan. So you want to make sure, okay, you're saying you can pay 500 a month in addition to your regular rent. Are you sure? Does this present a hardship for you? Because if it does, it can have a, you know, it's just delaying the inevitable. So you want them to come up with terms that they can adhere to. So it may be a repayment plan will make both parties happy. Tenant gets to stay, landlord is going to get all the money owed to them, plus the rent going forward. And there's other times when the tenant is paid to leave and all the claims are dismissed. They may make an offer to, for us a, a flat amount and say, well, you take this and dismiss all the claims. That's if the counterclaims are going to be a lot more. If the jury or if the judge decides in the tenant's favor, the tenant may be okay with a lump sum just to walk away and be done with it. So that's why it's important when your clients come in to really ask them, what is it that you want to achieve with this? What is, what is the outcome you would like to have? Because that is what is going to drive them and they make the final decisions on everything. They decide if they want to settle. They decide if they want to go to trial. We're just there to help them, but sometimes they may not understand that if they go to trial, they may lose. Whereas if they can work out a settlement and it's something they can live with, then that may be what they want to do. Let's talk about some of the defenses or counterclaims. Some of these we've touched on. The notice may be defective. So again, it may be you gave me a five-day notice and the same day you went down and you filed. Or you gave me this notice, but you didn't give it to me the proper way. Again, saying you served me personally, but I was at work, so you couldn't have served me personally. Or posting it on the door. And one of the jokes that people used to say is a lot of the bigger property management companies used to serve their five-day notices by slipping them under the door. And most tenants didn't know that that was not appropriate service. So a lot of them would just end up not going to court and just having an order for possession and a money count entered against them when they could have had the whole thing tossed saying the notice was defective. And a lot of the bigger companies used to do that a lot. They would just have someone go up and down high rises and just put them under the door. That's not appropriate service. So one of the 
defense that you can look at is the notice is defective. If the notice is defective, then the summons and the complaint are defective and it's tossed out. Landlord has to start all over again. Now, sometimes they'll just settle, other times they'll just file again. Again, if they file prematurely, that's a problem. If you give me a five-day notice or a 10-day notice, I have those days to either pay you or cure the defect or whatever the situation is. You can't give me the notice and then go file the same day. Where were my five days? Or if the rent was paid or the landlord is refusing to take it. If I have my rent, I was a little bit late, I have it all. And you're just refusing to take it. I walk into your office and you're like, nope, I can't take that. Yes, you can. There's also been times when someone has gone to the landlord with a partial payment and the landlord has taken that. Well, if you take a partial payment, you're voiding out your action. So if you agree to take a partial payment, you now have voided out the action you would have to file again because you've now received an amount from them. So the amount you were saying you were owed is not in line with what you were given. And a lot of newer landlords didn't realize that. So, oh, you have 600 of the 1200, I'll take it. Okay, but now I've voided out your five day notice because the amount you're saying I owe you is 600 less. So sometimes it's important to know how it all started because you may just be able to go in and have the summons and the complaint tossed out. If someone got a 10 day notice, say they were violating one of the terms of the lease and they've cured that defect, they're in compliance. So the landlord can't say they're violating the lease if they've cured that issue. It could be something as simple as you have someone there who's not, who's not on the lease and they've gone from a guest to being a resident who's unknown to me. So they either have to be added to the lease or they have to go. Well, if the person's gone, I'm in compliance. Maybe I have a satellite dish and I'm not allowed to have that. I've gotten rid of it, so now I'm in compliance. Maybe I have a grill on my deck. I'm not allowed to grill. I've gotten rid of the grill. I'm in compliance. So if they've cured that defect, then the landlord has to acknowledge that. You can't continue with this claim if the claim has been cured. Failure to maintain. Landlords have a duty to maintain their property. So a counterclaim could be the landlord didn't maintain the property. This is where you get into the things like warranty of habitability. If there's an issue with rodents, if there's an issue with cockroaches, bed bugs, it could be, you know, the landlord's allowing another tenant to disrupt someone's right to quiet enjoyment. Maybe you've told the landlord, the people upstairs, they have a lot of traffic in and out, they keep up noise at all hours, there may be some drug sales going on, all types of illegal activities, and the landlord doesn't do anything about it, and there's proof that this may have happened. Maybe the police have been over there, and the landlord has not done anything. That's a failure to maintain. If the landlord is supposed to provide all of the um, utilities, and the water's turned off, the heat is turned off, that's a failure to maintain, and that's an issue. The warranty of habitability, we talked about that. Even retaliation. Maybe there's some building code violations, and I called the city, and the city's been out, and they find the landlord, and the landlord found out it was me, and so now the landlord wants to evict me. If I can prove that it's retaliation, that's another defense. And please note that under the Evanston uh, ordinance, if a tenant files a complaint, and then the landlord files an eviction, it is automatically assumed to be retaliation. Those are those little subtleties that I said, you have to check each little city or village. They may have something that's in there that just says, yeah, we automatically assume it's retaliation. Interruption of tenancy. I've had people call and say, the landlord changed my locks, or my key to the front main door no longer works. They've cut off my access to the parking. The landlord has tampered with utilities. You cannot do any of that. Landlords seem to think, oh, well, if I turn off the lights, then they'll leave. You can't do self-help is what they call it. You're not entitled to do self-help. That's a huge problem. Discrimination is another under the you know, fair housing. So there are all types of defensive and counterclaims you're going to want to consider when someone comes into you depending on their fact pattern. 
So these are, this is just kind of a laundry list of all the things to think about. But the big thing I always see is some sort of issue with the warranty of habitability and the failure to maintain. For whatever reason, those seem to be things that the landlords have an issue with on as far as compliance. And there have been times when buildings have been taken over by the city and a receiver has been appointed. When things get to that point, that means the landlord has really failed to maintain. There was one building that had bricks falling off of it. And there was a school, and the kids were walking to school, and the bricks were just falling down because the landlord wasn't doing anything. You would see shut-off notices from the gas company. Nobody knew what was going on. They were paying rent and not getting basic services. The city took that property. They took it as, as under receivership. They appointed someone to collect the rent and make the repairs. And then the landlord was forced to prove that they could, from that point on, maintain the building in order to get their property back. So if it gets to a really bad state, a receiver could be appointed to take over the building. That means they're going to collect the rent. They're going to do all the repairs and make sure that it's safe and habitable. You want to also look at whether or not the court has jurisdiction over the person. Again, if they weren't served properly, there is no jurisdiction. The catch is sometimes tenants haven't been served, but they know they have a court date. I had someone where the landlord was texting her, you have court today. She had not been served, but she was terrified. She's like, he's telling me I have court today. So I went in just on a limited basis just to contest that the court had jurisdiction over her. I'm like, we're not admitting to anything. We're not going into the merits of this. There is no jurisdiction over the person. So please tell landlord texting her saying you have court today is not jurisdiction over her and that he has to get jurisdiction properly either personal service, the substitute service by leaving it with someone over the age of 13 who lives there, or the constructive service, which could be the posting on the door, that sort of thing. So if that hasn't happened, there's no jurisdiction over the person. A lot of times they'll just get it continued so they can try service again. And that's when you'll get into the special process server and getting someone appointed to do service. And I've found that the sheriff usually isn't able to get service, but I've got one of the best special process servers ever. He has, you know, said, hey, I have flowers for you. I'm the FTD delivery guy, and you get service. So, you know, sometimes, again, people will see the sheriff pull up because they're in the squad car, they're in uniform. They're not going to open up and accept service. Rarely will you see that happen. So if my suggestion is if after the first time, the sheriff was not able to get service, asked to appoint a special process server if you're representing that landlord, just to speed things up. Because a special process server, if they have a description of the person, if they know where they work at, they will tend to go that extra mile. I've had people served at work. I've had people served at church. Person can be served anywhere that they may be found. So if you are avoiding, but I know you will be there, I'm sorry, but it has to happen. So again, if there is no service, proper service, there is no jurisdiction. So as a person, as an attorney representing the landlord, you're going to want to avail yourself of a special process server. If you are representing the tenant, you really want to ask about that service and make sure that service was proper. Again, limited appearance. You can do a motion of quash. If the summons wasn't done properly, motion of quash. And what they'll look at is clear and convincing evidence. Generally, the person who did the service will have to come in, and they are asked questions by both sides to verify whether or not they were actually, they actually did service the proper way. And I've had to bring in my special process mm -hmm. server um, to say, this is who I serve, this is what they look like, this was the time of day. Everyone does an affidavit of service, but you can have a, an evidence hearing on whether or not service was really done properly. And you can ask questions of the person who says that they did the service, be it the sheriff. Generally, if the sheriff does an affidavit, it's accepted at face value. But for a special process server, 
You have to bring them in. The other side is allowed to ask them questions. And you don't always have to use a special process number. If you have someone over the age of 18 who's not a party to the litigation, you can have them do the service. You just have to make sure that they understand what that means and that they fill out the affidavit and they're able to come in and testify if they have to. And I've had people, you know, have a friend or someone do service for them and they would just go to the person. If the person, even if the person doesn't take it, I had someone like, oh, I was trying to serve her and she wouldn't take it, but I like took a picture of her throwing it down. Like I gave it to her, she bought it up and threw it down and they took a picture of that. Beautiful, because that was proof that you did service properly. What they did with it after they received it, that's on them, but they were properly served. So if there's an issue with jurisdiction, you're going to do a limited appearance, and you're going to want to either quash the service or ask to have a hearing on the service. And the judge will generally, using clear and convincing evidence, either say, yes, service was properly had on this person or not. If service wasn't proper, they've got to start over. Service can never be on a temporary guest. So if they don't know who lives there, they can't just assume the person answering the door lives there. And it can't be someone who just happened to stop by. It can't be a friend who is just there. So you cannot have service on a temporary guest. And there's a, a, a court case that you can reference. Now, let's talk about when you may want to do a motion to dismiss. Improper notice, premature filing of a complaint, or again, if the defect has been cured, we've paid all the rent, whatever the violation was, it's been resolved. So instead of filing an answer, you may just want to do a motion to dismiss. That will eliminate any doubt in anyone's mind on whether there is an issue that needs to be litigated. And if there's substantial evidence that it's been done, here are the receipts. All of the rent was paid. You know, here's the proof that whatever that violation was, it's been cured. Or it's as simple as, judge, look at the date on the five-day notice. Look at the date of the summons and the complaint. The five days had not expired. Premature filing. So it's all about whatever proof you can bring in that's appropriate to get the matter dismissed. Again, landlords will tend to just refile. If there's a defect like that, normally what they'll ask the judge to do is can you waive the filing fee so I can just file it again? Because they've spent money to do the filing. So what they'll say is can you waive the filing fee if I refile? And generally the judges will do that and give them a chance to cure the defect. So if it's something that can be worked out, instead of you filing another five day notice and another summons and complaint, is there something we can talk about to resolve this? Settlement should always be in the back of your mind because sometimes it's what's most practical for everybody. I mean, them filing, filing again is just delaying the inevitable. But maybe there's something that can be worked out between the parties. With the breach of warranty of habitability, be clear that it's the tenant's burden of proof to prove all of that. So they have to prove that there are these conditions that exist and it makes the place unfit and there's been damage that the tenant has suffered. So you can't just make the statement and say breach of warranty of habitability without having any proof. It has to be something that can be substantiated. Again, problems with utilities not being on, problems with mice or cockroaches or bed bugs. I've had people with leaks that have gone on for months and months and months and months. You know, things that make it unsafe, where the plaster is falling off of the ceiling because the leak has not been identified, it hasn't been fixed, and oh, by the way, that black stuff up there is now mold. And my child has asthma, and we've been to the ER three times. So, with the breach of warranty of habitability, it is the tenant's burden of proof. And that's another reason why when they come in, you ask them, do you have pictures, do you have video, do you have any receipts for any work that you had taken care of? All of those things help with proving damages as well. If the leak was so bad in one of the bedrooms that nobody could sleep in there, so you're charging them $1,200 for a two bedroom, but they can only really use one bedroom, that's damage. So you have to just be able to identify what that breach is and 
prove it, and then talk about the damages that will suffer. Now, they look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. How long was the defect there? What's the nature of it? How did it affect the habitability of the unit? Did the landlord know, or should they have known? And did they correct it in a reasonable amount of time? And I, I can see both sides of this coin. I had a case with a landlord who there was a leak. And he brought in three different people to try to find the source of the leak. Three different companies could not find the source of the leak, and he was still trying. He, in the meantime, plastered up the damage and painted it. And there was no mold. There was no moisture. He had the moisture reports. And the tenant still stopped paying rent and then tried to sue him, saying that she was in a horrible, horrible unit and the plaster was falling on her head and it was just horrible. But he had pictures. He had just been over there. You know, every time the people went out to look at the place, he went. And there were pictures to show there's a little watermark and I fixed that. He had all the receipts from the contractors. He had all the reports on what he was trying to do to find the source of this. So her case got tossed out. Had he not had proof, had he not done anything, she may have had a valid claim that there's a problem and he's done nothing. But at the same time, tenants also have to be vocal if there is a problem. So if the landlord doesn't know that you have an infestation, if you haven't told him, then you can't expect him to fix that problem if he's not aware of it. So it, it comes with a balance of, did the landlord know, or should he have known? Okay, once he's known, once he found out, once he's aware, what has he done to take corrective action? And is that enough, or is it not enough? And how has it affected someone's tenancy? This woman who says she had the leak, it didn't affect her tenancy. She was able to use the entire apartment. And it wasn't like it was a health hazard, a safety issue, it was none of that. But she just felt like, oh, I've asked you to do this and you're not doing it, so I'm not going to pay. But she had to admit, he's had people come out. So when you told him that there was an issue with the leak, what did the landlord do? Oh, he sent somebody. Okay, and then what happened? I still had the leak and I told him again, and what happened? He sent somebody. The judge was like, so he's taken corrective action he can't find the source of the leak, but he hasn't given up trying, and you haven't given him a chance to really take corrective action. But in the meantime, you haven't suffered any sort of loss. You have no damages. So with the warranty of habitability, tenant has to prove this. It's their burden of proof. And they'll look at these different, you know, items to say, okay, well, what's the problem? And how long has that been that way? And, you know, how does it affect them being able to live there? It could be a situation where the whole building may be uninhabitable. All of the apartments have a problem and the landlord is fully aware and has done nothing. That's a problem when they've called the city, the city's been out, the city's identified these issues, and there's been no corrective action. But it's a different situation if, okay, the heat went out because maybe there was a problem with the boiler in the basement, and once the landlord found out, he scheduled to have somebody come out, but for a day or two, the tenants didn't have heat. You have to look at the situation. As soon as he could, he got someone out. The right way to do things might be to give them a credit for those two days, but not all landlords see it that way. So when people are making these claims about the warranty of habitability, your job is to kind of look at the sense and sensibility of what they're saying and how that meshes with the evidence that they have as to how you want to proceed with that. It may be a counterclaim you want to raise, it may not. One of the things that you, I used to hear a lot from people in court was, or from landlords in particular, if my place is so bad, why are you still there? Just because someone stayed in a situation doesn't mean that there's not a problem with the habitability. Not everyone can just pick up and move or leave a situation. So the fact that someone stayed and they're raising this claim does not say, oh, there's really not a problem. It's just you have to look at the situation and you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis and say, 
Well, they had no other choice but to stay there. Again, not everyone can go and put down a security deposit and move somewhere else. So just to say, oh, you're claiming breach of warranty of habitability, but you're still there, it's not a defense. It's not something that the landlord can use to refute their claim. This is what I was talking about as far as retaliation and with, the, um, with Evanston. So in any action, buyer against the tenant, if there's evidence of a complaint within one year prior to the alleged act of retaliation, it may be presumed that the landlord was ret retaliatory. So again, if the tenant has exercised their right to complain with the city, and within a year, the landlord is moving to evict, there may be a presumption of retaliation. This is a troubled tenant. I just want them gone. They're causing the city to come out. I'm getting fined. You can't evict them because they contacted the city. Also with rent increases, that's also part of that. So if they complain after a rent increase, you have to look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis. I talked about this, you can't use self-help. So you just can't go in and say, I'm gonna turn off the lights, I'm going to remove the doors. There have been all sorts of things that landlords have done under the guise of self-help thinking, this will force that person to leave. And there have been cases where landlords have taken doors off of units or changed locks, done all sorts of things. <clears throat> Not allowed. And actually the uh, tenant could be uh, awarded damages if a landlord resorts to self-help. Pre-trial, if you're not able to settle, if you're given a trial date, things that you'll want to talk about are any motions in limine, jury instructions, witness lists, and a statement of the case. So that's something to think about pre-trial, because if you have to go to that point, judge will ask for jury instructions. They will ask for a statement of the case. They'll want to know how many witnesses you have. When you go to trial, you will have brought here. You'll have openings. Plaintiff will present their case. Defendant will present their case. Witnesses will be called. You'll have closing arguments, and then it'll go to the jury. If it's a bench trial, then the judge will decide. Now, if they find, this goes for like foreclosure cases, and this is important for some people as far as sealing uh, an eviction case. Right now, evictions are public record. So even if someone has filed an eviction case against someone, and it gets settled, it gets resolved, it's still out there. It's a major issue for tenants who are looking for apartments when these public records crop up. So, there's been discussion about whether or not there should be an automatic sealing of these records because it's impacting people's rights or their, their ability to move around. If there was a foreclosure case, and there are times when a homeowner or a property owner is in foreclosure and they don't tell the tenants, so the tenants have no idea, but there is also these evictions going on because the bank has taken back the property and now they want everybody out. If there was an eviction case that was filed under a foreclosure case, it is automatically sealed. If they're finding that there's no basis for it, it's sealed. Any other sealing of an eviction is at the, at the discretion of the judge. And I am finding a lot of times they will not agree to just seal. And generally the opposing counsel will not agree to seal. And I've asked as recently as last week, I asked the opposing counsel, I'm like, we've settled it, we have an agreed order. Will you also agree to seal this? She's like, absolutely not. And the judge that we were in front of typically does not allow them to be sealed. So no, for a case where someone is in a property that was foreclosed on, and there's an eviction, it will be sealed. Any other, it is up to the discretion of the court, and generally they don't seal. But there is a huge movement now to try to get these eviction cases sealed for people. If, for example, there's an agreed order or there was no basis for it, why should this public record exist? Even though they may have resolved it, there's no money count against that tenant, 
It's not going for collections. There's no garnishment. It's still a stain on their record that could prevent them from getting future housing. So again, for the foreclosure actions, it's mandatory. Let's talk about what happens after trial. You go to trial and there is um, a judgment entered against your client. Maybe there's a default judgment. And there have been times where people weren't notified that they had court. They didn't know they had a trial date. Suddenly the sheriff shows up with the eviction paperwork saying, we have an order for possession against you. You're going to want to go in and vacate that default judgment within 30 days. And that's when you get into, did they get the notice? Did they get the summons and the complaint? Sometimes they're not totally aware anything has happened until after they've got a judgment against them. So you're going to want to vacate that default judgment. Maybe you want to vacate the judgment because they didn't understand what they were signing. If someone was pro se and there's a, an order that was entered against them and they have no idea what was going on, you may want to vacate the judgment. There could even be an agreed order for possession that you want to vacate because maybe one side felt like they were forced to enter into it. Um. Can, can you ask to vacate a default judgment as a matter of right? The question was, can you ask to vacate a default judgment as a matter of right? If they had no notice, then you absolutely need to have it vacated. And there's, you can have it vacated within 30 days, and if you have su substantial proof that they were not served properly, it'll get vacated after 30 days. It's a harder burden to prove, which is why when things happen, you have to see what the dates are on these orders if someone comes in to you post-judgment. Within 30 days, as long as they have the proper proof, for example, that they were never served and that they never had any notice, they can get it vacated. If it's after that time, it becomes a harder burden. The orders for possession are given to the sheriff. That's because the sheriffs are the ones who effect the eviction. What that means is, because sometimes people are like, does that mean the sheriff will come out and put everyone out? The sheriff doesn't touch anything. What the sheriff does is, on the date of the, that the order for possession is executed, they contact the landlord or the landlord's representative and say, we're going to be out at the property between this time and this time. Someone must meet us with proper ID and a copy of the order, proof that you are the landlord or the landlord's representative. What they will do is they will post a sticker that says possession is now being turned over to the owner. The owner will have to remove any of the possessions in the property. The sheriff, they aren't going to touch anything. They're there strictly to provide law and order to the situation and make sure that there's no threat of harm to anyone. You know, they may get involved if there's animals, they may call animal care and control if there's animals on the premises. But they are not there to move anything out. They're there to basically hand over possession to the landlord, and it's for the landlord to get the items out and to deal with that sort of situation. At that time, the landlord can change the locks and that sort of thing. So the order has to go to the sheriff. There's a schedule that's even available online. You can call in and give them the warrant number and say, do you have a, a date for this? They'll also give a phone call. If for some reason the tenant is able to stay this order for possession, let's say they have an order for possession, they go in and they ask for more time. Maybe they have a child with special needs and they're like, I have another place to go to but it won't be ready by this deadline. I need another two weeks. If they, if they have proof of that, judges tend to extend or stay the order for possession. What they have to do is take it to the sheriff, because otherwise the sheriff has no idea that it's been stayed, and what that will do is they won't come out and enforce that order for possession. So if a, if a tenant is able to get more time, they have to notify the sheriff. Just getting that order will not do anything until they take it to the sheriff. And note that with e-filing, the sheriff system doesn't talk to the clerk of the circuit court system, so you still have to take that extra step and go to the sheriff. 
So they have to physically go into the sheriff and give them a copy of that order to stay any order for possession. If there's extreme weather conditions, they will not do the eviction. So if it's extremely cold out, snow, they will put off the evictions until it's a, it's a more humane time. So just keep that in mind, because a lot of times landlords are like, what's taking so long? Or a lot of times you'll get a question, is it true that I just shouldn't bother to evict anybody in the wintertime because they just won't do it? You can go through the process, but the sheriff will not do evictions in extreme weather. You can still have your order for possession, and, and when it's you know the right time, they will do it. At this time, whatever questions you have, let me know, and I'm going to repeat back the questions so everybody uh, can hear them, and then, yes. Uh, can the property manager bring the case as a plaintiff, or does it have to be by the owner? The question was whether or not a property manager can bring the case on behalf of the owner. As long as they are the agent of the owner, typically on the paperwork it will ask you if you are the owner or if you are the agent. And the lease will also state, like a lease will tell you who rent is to be paid to, who's to be contacted in an emergency. So a lot of people will list the property management on there so if there's an emergency the tenant knows who to contact. So the agent can bring the case. Typically, they just have to have the authority to do so. And a lot of the bigger um, property management companies, they will have the property manager who's there at court testifying as to what transpired as far as the notice and the rent record and, and that sort of thing. Yes? For retaliation, what evidence of a complaint do you have to have? Can it be an oral complaint made to the landlord? Does it have to be a complaint to the city of Evanston? What kind of complaint suffices? Generally, it has to be a complaint where there's a paper trail. Like, I've had people even do complaints with 311, but you get a return receipt saying we've received your complaint. They will send someone out from the city. And the landlord is notified when there's a complaint, you know, against them because if, they, if it's founded, if they find that there is an issue, they will want to discuss corrective measures with them. So generally, the issue is you want to make sure there is a paper trail. And I've even sent people down, like for the city of Evanston, I've sent them down to get copies of their complaints because it is all logged in, and that's evidence of them filing a complaint with the city if there is retaliation. A lot of times the he said, she said is a problem because you're both going to refute each other. But if there's text messages, if there's emails, if it's in writing, then you have substantiation that you've made these complaints. And if the landlord fails to do whatever they need to do, then people are free to contact the city at any time. That goes for Evanston or City of Chicago. And the complaint has to be made to the city in order for the retaliation um, provision to apply. Yes, because okay. the question was, does the complaint have to be made to the city in order for retaliation to apply? Generally. Yes, it does, because what the landlord or what the tenant is saying is, I've complained to a governing body, you've been penalized, and now you want to evict me because you're just angry that I have let them, you have made them aware that there's problems. Any other questions? Um, how, how often do you do you anticipate that we may be representing them uh, more occasionally? This is a question that came from actually a volunteer in my organization on whether or not we're going to be representing landlords. Generally, we do not represent landlords; we represent tenants. Okay. There are a few organizations that represent both. We just haven't really crossed that bridge yet. Can you file a motion for leave to file the answer on the return date, or does it have to be before? The question was, when can you file a motion for leave to file an answer? Generally, you're going to want to go in on that first return date, file your appearance, and let them know that you want to file an answer. There may be counterclaims or affirmative defenses, but you want to step up and let the judge know that you, you are going to file your appearance and jury demand if that's what you're going to do and then ask for leave to file those things.
I want to thank you guys for coming out, and I gave you guys the handouts. If there's any questions, just please let me know. I will print these out bigger for everyone. I'll do four on a page. So the font is bigger for everyone. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.